Isn't it interesting? Peter, his subject in his sermon to the many Jews, the multitude of Jews who spoke from uh, languages from all over the world, to whom the uh, 120 disciples addressed in the native language of these individuals, who were only from Galilee and wouldn't know these languages except supernaturally. They all thought it was gibberish or they were drunk or something. Peter says, no, this is the message. And then Peter, what does he do? Not only that, he goes back to the scriptures that these Jews would be familiar with and understand the message to testify to who Jesus is. Men and brethren, fellow Israelites, Peter says, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and in his tomb is with us to this day. In the sense that David's decayed remains were still in the tomb where his body was pierced, placed. Therefore, David being a prophet and having known that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on David's throne. A descendant then, in the sense that Jesus Christ in his humanity was a descendant from David and will be the everlasting ruler of the eternal kingdom of Israel and the world, sitting on the throne of David that, that David sat upon centuries earlier. Hence, having foreseen this, he, David, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. David was not speaking of himself in his own grave, but on Jesus Christ, the one descended from his loins, who would be the, the uh, Hamashiach, the Messiah, that uh, was promised through prophecy. And Psalm 16, 1-11 speaks of that. However, Peter was using the Septuagint, as opposed to the uh, Masoretic text, which it was a uh, Septuagint came about 3 BC, and the Masoretic text was uh, completed in about the 10th century. So we have uh, a value here in Peter's quoting the Septuagint to find out precisely what David is talking about, the Messiah to come. So let's move down. David prayed and trusted in God, therefore, for temporal and eternal salvation, declaring that there was nothing in life that was good apart from the Lord. He delighted in fellowship with fellow saints and rejected those who hastened after other gods. The Lord was his inheritance, hence he was incomparably and pleasantly blessed. Hence David blessed the Lord who gave him counsel day and night. Psalm 16.1-16.11 David was evidently in harm's way, which motivated him to trust in the Lord for protection. So he prayed to God to preserve him in the sense of saving him from harm in his mortal life. And as this evidently included trusting in the Lord for eternal life, Psalm 1611. And he declared that he had put his trust in the Lord to that end for temporal and eternal life, Psalm 16.1. In the next verse, David elaborated upon that trust. O oh, my soul, referring to himself, speaking out to the Lord in prayer, my goodness is nothing apart from you, indicating God, David's understanding that everything that is good comes from the Lord, and that anything that David does apart from the Lord is nothing. Furthermore, David declared that as for the saints who are on the earth, referring to fellow believers in Christ, those like David who trusted alone in the Lord for temporal and eternal salvation, they are the excellent ones in whom is, is my delight, in the sense that these were the ones whom God had set apart as his own, of excellent or noble quality as persons relative to godliness, in whom David declared that he was delighted in having fellowship with. Note that the Hebrew word rendered saints in the New King James Version literally means holy ones, set apart ones, which implies being set apart for the Lord relative to being his possession and having a relationship of an intimate fellowship with them, both temporal and eternal. On the other hand, David addressed the destiny of those who had hastened after other gods. Let me give that back. Their sorrow shall be multiplied, evidently in their temporal and eternal lives. David indicated that he would not do as they did. Such an offering drink such an offering drink offerings of blood, in the sense of celebrating the shedding of human blood in some manner, nor would he speak the names of the other gods with his lips. Rather, David had decided to trust exclusively in the Lord. Our God, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You mentioned my lot. Everything that his life afforded him, David trusted to be exclusively and from the Lord. 
And David reported that as a result of trusting exclusively in the Lord, the lines in the sense of the boundary lines of his life have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have good inheritance. David compared God's blessings, which he received to the best inheritance a person could possibly receive. And that would be the person and presence of the Lord himself. So David responded to the Lord because of the blessedness he received in his life from the Lord saying, I will bless the Lord in the sense of praising the Lord as a grateful acknowledgement of his blessings received who has given me counsel, my heart also has instructed me in the nights, in the sense that the Lord counseled David in the nights as well as in the days, guiding him to, guiding him to lead a godly life. The Lord did this, David said, through his heart and through his mind. Karma, this is probably on the heart and the mind. Man's, see the man's moral and mental activity. So David declared that he had set the Lord always before him, and because the Lord would always be at his right hand, David would not be moved from this godly walk. Therefore David's heart was glad. The glory of his godly personal honor rejoiced. His tongue rejoiced in the Lord, and his body rested in the sure hope of temporal and eternal salvation. David declared that the Lord would never leave his disembodied soul in Sheol, nor would he allow his Holy One, the Messiah, to see corruption in the grave implying resurrection. Finally, David declared that the Lord would show him the path of life. And in the Lord's presence, there would be a fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, implying eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. And that's what, notice in Psalm 16:8, Masoretic text, and then what Peter quoted from Acts 2:25, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And for David says from the uh, Acts 2.25 concerning him, Jesus, I was foreseeing the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Pretty much the same thing. So we're talking about the Septuagint and the more accurate rendering of Acts chapter, uh, Psalms chapter 16. So David declared that he had set the Lord always before him. And because the Lord was always at David's right hand in the sense of being so close that he was in the best position to be David's protector, comforter, and savior. Hence, David declared that he would rather neither be moved in the sense of being distanced from the Lord, nor shaken by what life would bring, nor diverted from his walk of godly integrity, hence not separated from the blessings of the Lord. Something we need to do as a constant reminder. As a consequence, the psalmist, Psalm 16, declared that his heart was glad and that his glory in the sense of his personal honor rejoiced at the closeness that he had with the Lord, as evidenced by his temporal salvation from harm, protection, and blessings, which David received as a result of David's faith in him. For David rejoiced in his heart and mind and with his tongue. Furthermore, relative to his flesh, his body, David declared that he would rest in the hope, literally the sure hope, of temporal and eternal salvation in the Lord. Hence, David was implying that he would forever have an intimate relationship with the Lord, in his mortal life, and then in the eternal kingdom of God. David declared, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the place of the conscious afterlife after the soul, in the sense of his soul after death, not being left in the realm of the dead, outside of the fellowship of the Lord. So although David's body would decay in the tomb in which his dead physical body was placed, David's disembodied soul would continue in intimate relationship and fellowship with the Lord absent from the body, present with the Lord. For David had the sure hope of being re resurrected to eternal life and eternal kingdom of God. David went on to say in Psalm 16:10b, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So literally see the pit in the sense of the dead physical human body of the Holy One, not experiencing physical de decay or corruption in the grave. This obviously refers to David's descendant, Jesus Christ. It does not refer to eternal condemnation as some contend, especially in the light of the interpretations of Peter and Paul in Acts 6, 13, 35-37, and the Septuagint translation, which the Lord and both the apostles quoted from. Although David did imply that he was one of the cordisum in Psalm 16, 3, rendered saints in the New King James Version, implying one who is set apart in a temporal and eternal relationship with the Lord. Since David's body was buried, he was not resurrected, hence his physical body did experience physical decay, then... Therefore, the unique Holy One in verse 10 cannot be referring 
to David. It evidently refers to another, the unique Holy One of Israel, the Messiah, whose physical body, God's word promised in Psalm 1610, would not experience physical decay. But once it was placed in a tomb and sealed up, it was evidently immediately raised from the dead. This is the descendant of David. Note that this passage neither stipulated nor implied that eternal life must be received through one's faithful works, as some contend. Everywhere we go, we have those contenders for works salvation. David went on to say to the Lord in Psalm 1611, You will show me the path of life in the sense that the Lord will show David how he was to conduct his mortal life, the path of life that he was to take. And in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore, implying that the path was to be in the presence of the Lord and that David would experience the resurrected eternal life in the presence of the Lord in the eternal kingdom of God. According to this passage, it is clear that the resurrection of the uncorrupted Holy One of God is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in Psalm 16:10b, and that he was absolutely essential to David's reception of eternal life. Peter pointed this out to the crowd of Jews in Jerusalem in his interpretation of the passage when he addressed the crowd of Jerusalem on Pentecost. So we move on to Acts, 6, uh, Acts 2, 32-33. In this passage part, Peter continued to address the crowd and declare, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And they were. Peter declared that he was exalted at the right hand of God the Father, and as promised by the Father, Jesus received the Holy Spirit, whom God declared Jesus had poured out the Spirit, and whose work you now see and hear in the disciples speaking in the tongues of the world of the marvelous works of God to all the Jews present from all over the world, especially of Jesus Christ, and him crucified, resurrected, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's what he covered. Not a whit about the Jews having to repent and turn from their sins, but to repent and believe what he said about Jesus being Lord and Christ. So Peter made a remarkable declaration to the crowd of Jews in order to bring home to them the message of the risen Christ in a personal way emphasizing that God was the one who raised up Jesus from the dead. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Having corroborated the resurrection of Jesus with Scripture, Peter declared that he and the 120 disciples from the upper room who had accompanied him were eyewitnesses that God raised Jesus up from the dead. Peter went on to say, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, in the sense of exalting him to the supreme position of glory, power, and authority in the universe, evidently a declaration and demonstration of his victory over sin for all mankind. Whereupon Peter declared, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, in his exalted position of glory, power, and authority, poured out this, the Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear in the disciples, in the sense of the pouring out into each individual disciple the Holy Spirit is evidenced by the power they express to speak in known languages, to the communicate the words of the Lord to them in their native language, which Peter was now also uh, conveying to the crowd. And the disciples spoke to the crowd in the, of the marvelous works of God, especially of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. The outpouring of the Spirit was further evidence of Jesus' resurrection and exaltation to the right hand of the Spirit. Note that the baptism pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples was the promise of the Father and the giver of the Spirit, Jesus, was the baptizer, the one who poured out the Spirit forth, baptizing the disciples. This was a clear distinction of the persons of the Trinity. More on this next time.